the role of athletes in addressing the climate and ecological crisis? How do athletes decline sponsorship from fossil fuel companies? And how does a vegan diet affect strength and stamina of world champions? In this episode of Tipping Points, we'll hear from two athletes who joined Extinction Rebellion in their mission to make the world a better place. Welcome to Etienne Stott, an Olympic canoeing champion, and Laura Baldwin, an Olympic sailor. I'm excited to interview athletes for the second series of Tipping Points, where this time we'll hear from activists from various backgrounds. Firstly then, Laura, please bring us up to speed on your background. I was an Olympic sailor, two-time Olympic sailing coach, having this really nice, comfortable lifestyle. And then I flew to Zurich for a long weekend to catch up with my first sailing training partner, who's flown in from San Francisco. She was attending the World Economic Forum and had these papers she needed to read before she attended. And I read them to her because she was jet lagged. And to me, it was like reading the script for a horror movie. Um, It was also the first time that I heard Greta Thunberg stood outside in the snow talking. And I turned to my friend and I'm like, is what this kid's saying for real? Like, how can that be? And my bubble of contentment just burst in that moment. And from that time, my life has just not been able to be the same. I've just focused entirely on um, researching everything about the problems and also the solutions. Initially, making all the eco swaps myself then looking to help my community and eventually it led me to activism because I realized that it has to come from government. I read the IPCC report um, summary. I watched loads of documentaries. I read all the articles. Um, Facebook worked out what I was interested in and just kept feeding me lots of articles about everything that, you know, all these problems. And to me, it's like, whoa, you know, emergency, emergency, everything's going to have to change. But other people were not getting fed that same information that I was. (laughs) So things weren't changing. And I realized, you know, that I I felt really alone at that time, because before I learned about Extinction Rebellion, the first time I heard of them was April Rebellion. Yeah, it felt really, really strange to be aware of this information and aware that nobody was talking about it. Thank you. And Etienne, please give us a brief outline of your path through life until now. I was born in Manchester, grew up in a place called Bedford and I joined the scouts there. Like, you know, I was in the Cubs and joined the scouts and I had really cool scout leaders and they took us all canoeing and climbing and caving and all that. And I I took up canoeing and somehow at that time in my life, I, you know, was really excited about doing something seriously and I kind of switched into becoming an Olympic champion in canoeing you know, and dedicated basically the next 20 years, you know, shaped every life decision that I made was based on that. We went on to win the London Olympics and I basically went on after London to go to Rio. You know, scouts had given me a love for the outdoors and canoeing got to go to some really cool places and see, you know, really feel the power of beauty of nature. And it's hard to say, but once I retired after the Rio Games, which I didn't get to go to, I finished off studying a degree in Open University in psychology. I did some really important modules on critical social psychology, which is kind of like almost like the activist kind of arm of psychology, where it's like about studying about power and how, you know, society is built. And I think that's really one of the most important things that happened and switched me on to, you know, seeing, because I was kind of a bit politically aware, you know, and I was thinking when I retired, would I become a politician or would I become a, you know, a coach or a you know, go into the media or something. And it was really then that I started to think about, see, you know, all the things, the different threads that all kind of come together in this way. And and around about then Extinction Rebellion kind of came into my consciousness and I did some training. I did the non-violent direct action training, which is kind of like where you learn kind of what peaceful disobedience is about and the real consequences. And I really realised, actually, I don't think they're that big a deal for me. I can do this. It's the right thing for me to do. And then I got involved and I got heavily involved and, you know, I've been involved in peaceful protests and I've been arrested and I was involved in April rebellion that Laura saw. And then I've done everything ever since in my group in Nottingham and I've done all bits and pieces and, but I'm really consider myself a canoeist and a rebel. Laura, are you still involved in sailing at all? I did two championships this year. I took my son to the mirror championships and he loved that. 
Um, but I had to incorporate activism in it. So down the side of our boat, it had big, bold black letters, act now with the XR symbol in the zero, in the O. Um, and I did the Europe Nationals, which was the boat I raced in Athens. Um, I borrowed a boat and they'd seen that I'd branded up my boat at the Mirror Nationals and said it was OK to brand their boat up for it. So I chose to um, put Ocean Rebellion down the side of it and make very much that whole um, event about educating people about how we need to be custodians for the oceans, the problems that the oceans hold, and um, used every interview opportunity to be able to speak about the problems and what needs to be done about it. Um, so I dabble, and Etienne and I are also enjoying learning to windsurf, which is quite entertaining and fun. Um, and it's more about family fun now. So it's fair to say that you're both in a relationship. Was it your passion for the climate and ecological emergency that uh, helped to bring you together? Well, I guess we kind of crossed paths because of something that I saw that Laura was involved in, that a mutual friend was helping with. And then we just kind of got chatting and, it, you know, it's like, and it's really nice, you know, to be with Laura because she understands, I guess, you know, and I guess I understand the pressures that we feel and also the, the things that we do, maybe seen as sacrifices by some but I see as kind of necessary and, and right. It's good to be with someone that totally gets you from all, all angles of your life. Have you seen relationships change as their understanding of the crises grows at different rates? Yeah, my relationship before FTN changed in that way. I was completely obsessed with the crisis and not able to carry on with coaching and you know high carbon intensive activities. And yeah, so that did sort of lead us in different directions. You know, being an activist, I think it brings changes to the way that you see things and, and it, it tends to kind of, you start to see something and then you see more and it, you can find yourself, you know, learning more and more. And, and sometimes, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, it's not even a quest for truth. It's just, you know, one foot goes in front of another and you can find yourself a distance from where you came from. And of course, you're still the same, you know, that you're still underneath the same, but you've got this really different understanding of the world. And I, I should imagine it's probably similar to someone who's like, you know, they have like religious understandings that change, you know, or a very different religion, you know, different worldview. And it does place a strain on relationships, you know, in your family, even with your friends, your best friends, they are still your best friends. But I guess it's a little bit you know, sometimes people are a little bit kind of sheepish around me eating like a steak or, you know, saying, oh, we're flying on holiday. And I'm like, guys, you know, it's all right. I don't hate you for this. It's something that, you know, in the end, we have to change these things. But, you know, they're still my best friends and I think I'm still theirs. Close relationship I have seen, yeah, really difficult for some people when one of the partners is like, just doesn't get it. And the other is like, when something like this really exposes that difference then I think it's yeah it is tricky especially with uh, Extinction Rebellion because the media gives such a different picture of what the movement is and you know paint us as this extreme criminal organization but from the inside it's completely not at all as we're portrayed to be like it's full of the most incredibly compassionate kind just deeply concerned individuals I, all my best friends now are within the movement Extinction Rebellion is full of doctors lawyers scientists academics um, street cleaners like the full range of different backgrounds and, and things it's very diverse but um, for me it is having the scientists and the doctors involved that gives me that sort of feeling of trust and credibility that these experts are involved here and you know i'm in the right most people when they meet people from extinction rebellion it doesn't you know those those stereotypes don't really survive you know I, I do end up talking quite a bit with my buddies about what i'm doing and why and you know they're curious and i do think it pulls people along yeah uh, pulling people along is critical but the main criticism of xr is that it pushes people away right so um, one real draw for people is the concept of citizens' assemblies where decision-making has more connection with citizens, right? So, uh, Laura, would you mind explaining how that works? So just like a, a jury is randomly selected, a citizens' assembly, the people that would be involved in that would be randomly selected, but they would be selected by a process called sortition. So it would represent um, the, the demographic. So your ages, sexes, religions, incomes, all of that sort of represented within this pool of people that are then taught deliberative skills and decision-making skills. And then they come up with the solutions that the government should be led by. So it should be legally binding. 
you've then got every voice sort of inputting into how we move forward so that everyone's needs are met, which I think is an incredibly genius way of moving forward out of this because politics at the moment is paralysed by popularity, by needing to win votes. And so, in fact, this process would strengthen politics. It wouldn't take power away from them. It would enable those difficult decisions to be made without the politicians having to shoulder the burden of the blame of some unpopular decisions of what we will have to change. You know, it's not the rich people, it's not the super educated people um, that we need to make the decision. We need ordinary people to make these decisions because that's the fairest and most sensible way. And that will inherently create towards the, the way that we need things to go, basically a fairer, you know, the society that we need to get through this emergency is a fairer, nicer society, a more caring community. And that will be created once you get some of the, you know, those nasty vested interests basically out of the room and the skew of the, you know, the status quo. And actually, you know, I really, I'm really passionate about this because I think that, you know, we can get out of this mess and make the lives of ordinary people way better, you know, warmer homes, better transport to get around, perhaps people working less brutally hard and less horrendously stressful lives, um, better food, better health, better, um, you know, a better balance in society in all of those ways. To me, these are really sensible things and they're fair. The interesting thing is how the media try to turn, I think, um, this into like, oh, it's middle class people or some other people telling ordinary people what to do. I've got some questions about the media. Uh, when you stuck your heads above the parapet and said you were members of Extinction Rebellion, did you have any media training to prepare for journalists twisting your words? And is it really worth going on GB News with the potential of being misrepresented? Yeah, so I didn't stick my head up initially for the first couple of years to say I'm an Olympian. I just was Laura, a part of Extinction Rebellion. And um, it was this year that I decided to actually step up and use, or the end of last year, um, to use the fact that I am an Olympic athlete to draw the media attention. And it does work. The first action I did as an Olympian was with Ocean Rebellion, um, projecting images onto the side of the cruise ships here at Weymouth Bay to draw attention to the pollution that they cause. And after that, um, I did get pulled into XR spokespeople group and given training for this year of how to deal with difficult journalists. And also just listening to all the previous interviews and learning from everybody that's gone before and the sort of questions that are asked and the answers that they give. And um, yeah, thinking about how you can best answer those questions. You know, I got asked by the media quite a lot, you know, are you not worried about your reputation? I'm like, what's the reputation on a dead planet? You know, if we get hit by any of these massive mega storms, what's it going to matter? The only thing that I'm concerned about is the future of my eight year old son and all the children and all the life on this planet being able to, to continue inhabiting. We've heard direct from the EU deputy Franz Zimmerman that this is a case of, you know, we've got a choice here. We either choose to change or we're forced to change. And the force is going to be the fact that nature will not feed us, it will not provide us water, that our children will be fighting over basic necessities. And it's going to be ugly and society is going to collapse. We're talking about the most sensible thing ever in the history of the world to do. It's the most sensible thing to do is to save the planet. And of course, you can say, I don't like this way of doing things. And I could say, actually, I don't particularly like it either. I'd much rather be doing, you know, workshops and coaching young athletes, whatever. Mm -hmm. But my understanding of the situation, my understanding of history, and sort of work that I learn about and things that I've seen, and also judging how we've been already, we, this met these methods are successful. They are, they do work. They don't work in the way that people imagine, but they push, they push the direction. They, they, they expand the envelope of conversation that people can have. So that you do get people starting to talk about, you know, oh, you know, what about this insulation thing? You know, what about, oh, maybe I can go meet free for a few days or something like that. You know, I mean, people never would have talked about these things before. I try to be really clear about myself, but I think it's really important to try and just be normal and kind and show that we're, you know, that I'm a good person, a sensible, responsible person who is aware of this situation and has decided to act in a way that seems most effective. And I, you know, I can relate that easily to sports. That's what we do in sports. You say, I want to do something. I want to win a gold medal. 
and you go go away and do the most effective training to achieve that goal. And if we'd have been really tackling this 10 years ago, we could have done it through the ballot or through the petitions and through letter writing. But those things didn't work then because there wasn't enough pressure and there wasn't enough awareness. And so now we're at this stage and I believe it is sensible. As I say, it's the most sensible thing in the world to save the planet for everybody and for everyone yeah. in the future. Yeah, so speaking about awareness, uh, Laura, could you go into more detail about the problems around cruises? They use the the dirty heavy oil as soon as they're offshore, the heavy fuel oil, which is the most polluting. Um, so one cruise ship's emissions are equivalent to a million cars' annual emissions, you know, each day. So it's like a massive, massive uh, emitter. And and then you've got the raw sewage, like a, an Olympic swimming pool, or is it ten Olympic swimming pools worth of raw sewage a week that's dumped into the ocean when they're at full capacity? Um, they're not supposed to, but they have to pay to offload it when they're on the dock. So many of them do. Being on the on board the deck of uh, of a cruise ship is like a bad day in Delhi for the pollution for the actual people that are on board. It's not healthy, and some of them have like kids' playgrounds and stuff right below the chimney, and and it's just um, we don't have the emissions left for luxury. That's interesting uh, that you say that because I guess people outside sport might be thinking. If flying around the world could be luxury to, you know, be a part of the regatt- regattas or the Olympics and that kind of thing. So I wonder how that sits with you and what you think about flying, especially within the sport. Further point, this is why I think it's even more important for athletes to speak out and people who have got a history, a high carbon is history. Like, you know, I cannot deny my footprint was absolutely monstrous, you know, when I was an athlete. Uh, equipment, travel, diet travel 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 you know and people say oh you know oh you you've had your fun now and you're telling us not to do it anymore you know and it was all great for you you did your olympic dream and now what about us and i'm like well yes that, that's really sad but this is the reality that we're in now we cannot do those things it's just not possible it's just not we have to start grasping that it's super sad it's really difficult and I am, you know, I did, and I did, I have changed, you know, I've changed lots of things in my lifestyle, but the thing is what I'm trying to say, and you know, I'm, I'm coming across this more and more, people are saying, you know, oh, have you got your house insulated properly? And, you know, I say, actually, yeah, I have my house is, but it could be better. I still own a car, you know, uh, and my f- food, I have to buy it from the local supermarket. I don't, you know, I don't get it grown in my backyard. We all have this impact and it's really powerful when people own up to A, their history and B, their hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, we're all hypocrites because we are all embedded in this system. You cannot, you know, live life in a low impact way in the UK unless you're extraordinarily committed. And you probably don't even see these people because they're probably living, you know, out of the way somewhere, you know, tending to their vegetables all day. Um, a credit to them. But I'm saying here, you know, we need support from our you know, our, our system, you know, our society to be able to, to live the way that we actually need to do, which is to live within the means of our planet. And then we have to, first of all, just admit to ourselves that we like sports, but if we like sports and we respect younger generations and they want, we would like them to like sports, we have to respect our planet and we have to change what we're doing. We have to have, we just have to go there. We have to really grasp that nettle. It's painful and it's a nettle, you know, it stings. That's what a nettle does. You don't say that. And then we're looking towards ways of localizing our sports. You know, we travel in canoeing, travel all around the world, many flights. You know, there's ways of reducing that, reducing the number of international competitions, perhaps having more competitions domestically. And again, it's simply, you know, these are not, it's not going to be as fun. It isn't going to be as rock and roll as it was in the 2000s. Um, but it could be a different sort of fun because we'll be actually at home doing things you know, with our community rather than, you know, separating the top five people in our community and sending them off all around the world. There's lots of different things that we, but we simply just have to kind of grasp this. If you sort of stop traveling as much, and that was actually a bit that was wearing for me, was constantly, you know, every other week or every week almost, you're in a different country and it's exhausting traveling around. You miss your friends and family, you feel homesick. So if it, that was actually forced not to happen, you had to spend much more time domestically in your local club, and especially for kids growing up, you know, forming those friendship bonds can actually really improve grassroots level um, sport. I feel that you're not taking the best away. So the level overall sort of increases in each area. 
area. And then when you go to a competition, because it, there are fewer of them, it's way more special. So it's much more of a big thing. So the Olympics can actually become an even bigger, like amazing thing, because look, all these people from around the world are coming together to compete. I think we can still travel. It will just take longer initially. Like, you know, you go by train or you can sail boat. Um, there are cruise ships now that are being developed that have massive sails and solar panels and it's going to happen. We are going to transition to zero carbon transport. Um, it's just, you know, how quickly is that going to happen and um, mm. how many people are going to be able to access that? It, to me, you know, flying is a hard one because people like going on holidays. But then at the same time, people have loved staying in this in this country during the lockdown you know and lo- most people don't know that much about our country i don't think and all the cool places to go in it. more to come in a second but i'd like to say at this point that i'll be recording interviews on the topics the police the media education and air travel from the start of February. So if you have any questions about the role of these topics in addressing the climate and ecological crisis, or to give feedback on the podcast, please email tippingpoints, all one word, at imperial.ac.uk. You can find the privacy policy at the Imperial College Grantham Institute website. Now, on with the podcast. I've got a question about sponsorship in sport. It would be really hard for a a young athlete, maybe in an e-sport, to say no to a sponsorship deal from an environmentally damaging company like HSBC or Barclays or something. But uh, high high profile athletes like Ronaldo could move the Coke bottle off the table during interviews. And that might have uh, a much, and that might have much more ability to encourage ethical sponsorship. And maybe that would force the change in sponsorship all the way down. What do you think about that? So these companies should in theory be reined in by the citizens assembly that Laura was talking about, you know, because they can't carry on companies like Ineos, which is sponsoring our British cycling team who are no friends of the environment. Is it really nice that when Shell come and sponsor something and they've got like their pictures of their turbines or their, their solar panels, it gives you the impression that they're doing a cracking job of, uh, you know, going to a low carbon economy when in fact they are the, you know, the amount they invest in renewable technology is absolutely dwarfed by their continued exploration and exploitation of existing, uh, you know, oil and gas fields and, and new oil and gas fields in places around the world that literally can't afford it. They are wrecked because of this. And I have utmost sympathy for those people in the British cycling team who take their pennies from uh, Ineos and they probably find it a little bit complicated and difficult. I wish they weren't in that situation, but I hope that they kind of aware, at least kind of glance behind the curtain and look at what Ineos is doing, what they, you know, what their style is. I actually think if someone said on the, you know, in their, amongst their community, oh, I was approached by such and such a, you know, company, and I said no because it's not good for the environment, it's not good for my future. Can someone else step up and sponsor me? You know, I think that would be an interesting experiment because I think, interestingly, people would come out the woodwork for that. Laura, how is sponsorship in sailing? Yeah, well, uh, this Ineos is uh, sponsoring one of our America, the British America's Cup team. <laughs> I think it's on it's in its final days for sure. It's going to be phased out anyway. I read something this week and I can't remember the actual statistics, but it said that athletes and celebrities were a huge percentage more influential than politicians and scientists. And that the, it's the politicians and scientists that have been trying to, and academics that have been trying to speak about the climate crisis. And that actually we need our celebrities and our sports people speaking about it because people actually listen to them and are actually far more influenced by them. Um, so, you know, athletes, managers of teams have huge power and influence over the general population and should be empowered um, and motivated to use that power for good. A lot of international rugby players wrote to the World Rugby uh, Mm. Federation basically to say, you know, we need you guys to step up and help us here. And it doesn't take, you know, if there's one person in each team who's like massively into it and can explain it, you know, I always really interested to know, you know, what it's like to be on a team with Marcus Rashford. It's like having a really hot radiator. You know, you can't help but be warmed by it if it's in the corner of the room. You know, some of these got people are boldly, boldly speaking their minds and it can't help but kind of wash into some you know, other people. And bit by bit, 
it amps up and it, and it it creates more momentum and more warmth if you want to use the analogy start people start radiating that themselves um but i think it's really interesting that sports has got this this reach and this power and it's also got this hurdle that it has to grasp which is this hypocrisy and this historical responsibility yeah the point you made laura that decisions that athletes make have a a large influence on the public i wonder how much influence their diets can make uh, for, I mean, for example, there are many misunderstandings that, that meat and dairy are a part of like this balanced diet and that meat and eggs are needed for muscle growth. And this kind of food pyramid concept is a myth that really needs to be addressed. Um, well, both for our own health, but also for the health of our ecosystems in the biosphere. Right? Uh, can sports personalities influence people's diets i agree definitely on everything you've said there that they have the power of influence and that we don't need meat to be strong and i think the world's strongest man or like i don't know was it crops fit or one of those um was a vegan and it's it's yeah we were we've been told all these misperceptions of what we need to eat and how it will improve our health and actually you work out that it's the opposite with milk and dairy etienne i know you've been on this journey longer of being vegan yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting thing. So I, um, you know, I was definitely like, I couldn't eat a meal. I had a rule basically that I wouldn't eat a meal without meat in it when I was training. And um, I had epic amounts of cheese and ham for lunch. And and then and then I became a vegetarian and then I, and I became a plant-based vegan um, subsequently. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, I think that there's, there's you know, the famous... T- yeah, famous film was called Game Changers that I think really you know they, I don't know all about the exact science and all of it behind it but it made it very you know made it and there are lots of very successful plant-based athletes out there now that's that's no no denying that I myself am now plant-based and I would venture I'm still feel very fit and strong. I still I only go canoeing you know once or twice a week go running you know once or twice a week depending but I still would say if someone looked at me, they would think that I looked at, a, you know, the physique of an athlete. I've not wasted away. I still. But basically, one of the things that you learn as a, as a vegan or tend to, it seems to me, is that you learn to cook home cooked food. And actually, as an athlete, I was really committed to that. And we were always that was drummed in. Just, you know, don't buy rubbish food, make it yourself. And that's very healthy and good for you straight away. And in fact, we were you know urged to have eight portions of fruit and veg a day you know, rather than the five recommended. And actually, I think that athletes can have this big impact um, because they do normalize behaviors and eating a lot less, you know, animal products is really good for you. And I think there's ample, and as far as I'm concerned, completely fine with being completely plant-based. And I actually, one of the things, if I, again, if I was in a slightly different situation, I'd like to go down to the gym one winter and just go and get strong and see how strong I could be and just say, actually, it's complete. I am completely fine. I'm sure I could lift, given a few months run up, what I used to be able to lift in canoeing. I think it is interesting, you know, people say, oh, you know, you, well, Ronaldo moved his bottle and, you know, athletes are using reusable bottles and all that sort of thing. You know, we have to talk about waste and stuff, but there's so much more that athletes could do and and uh, be a bit you know, bit 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 bolder and also a bit more truthful because yeah, we don't we don't need any more plastic bottles in the world, uh, but we do not need more carbon emissions in the world at this point. So I think yeah, I'm, I'm always kind of saying, look, guys, let's just push a bit more. I wonder though that if the message is just to cut out meat, then people would see that as a limitation or restriction or a loss, rather than seeing it as a way to explore new flavors from new spices and and eating new foods that people haven't tried before. Um, but then I guess there's a, a danger of cutting out nutrients without replacing them and, and then suffering the health impact. So I wonder if the message could be delivered in, in a way that promotes healthy plant-based diets rather than simply just a vegan diet. So, yeah, what are your thoughts about that? I think you really hit the nail on the head of it's got to be everything, all the changes that we need to be, need to make um, we should be thinking more as advertisers of how to sell that and how to make people want it as opposed to focusing on what we've got to give up. Let's focus on what we're going to gain. 
um, it took me two years to properly transition to vegan because it is a whole new um, learning. Like, uh, learn how to make vegetables tasty. And if you weren't that keen on veggies in the, st- the beginning, you know, it's quite a quite an education. I now know how to make the most incredibly delicious meals. And I enjoy my food a lot more now than I did when I ate meat because everything I eat is just so tasty. Yeah, the government, obviously, the biggest influence um, and could you know, press buttons within education, within restaurants, you know, to be big influences. But I think everyone can play a role in it. Just try one meal at a time and and find something that looks nice so that you taste it and you're like, yeah, that was good, cool. Mm. Uh, I'm going to try another one (laughs) and keep the learning process going. So, yeah, more on supermarkets. Um, Sainsbury's were at COP and I was really surprised to see that they had a stand there to say that milk and dairy make up 8% of a nutritious and balanced diet. Almost as though they were being paid by the industry in some way. So uh, why would a supermarket give the impression that that milk and dairy are necessary to be healthy? Uh, Although, I mean, it did say in the tiny font at the bottom that uh, fortified dairy alternatives are good sources of protein, calcium and vitamins. Uh, But this was in the small print for some reason. So, yeah, why would supermarkets dodge educating people about diets that are sustainable and less damaging to the environment? Thank you for drawing that back to my attention, because I had already decided to target Sainsbury's because they did an advert on the front page of at least three mainstream media newspapers um, just before COP promoting steak with Sainsbury's and the fact that they were the premier partner of COP26. And I'm like, those three things are not going together. Like, why have you done this? So uh, it is actually um, an action that needs to be taken to to approach Sainsbury's and go, what are you, why are you doing this? What are you doing this for? Obviously, there's the, the reason is obvious. When it, why does anyone advertise it to make money? So it's it's at the bottom of the end of the day, it's it's profit over people and planet again. So um, it needs bringing to task. Etienne, have you anything more to? Yeah, I mean, I think the there's this idea there's supply and demand, right? And at the moment, there's almost no kind of mention about supply. And you know, newspapers say, "Oh, we just provide the news that people want to read." supermarkets say we just provide the food that people want to read sports just say we just want to provide the sports that people want to consume but actually that's not true because it's a balance and it absolutely is and i think it, one of the things is is that right now these the usual way of doing things business as usual is incredibly profitable changing your business model is very difficult and actually at the moment we need to change the business models of all you know, so many companies we need to change this our very idea of a business model. You know, the food that we eat is probably the most one of the most important things. You know, in sports, it's drummed into you. At the end of the day, this this planetary emergency that we're in is a health emergency. Yeah, is a health of individuals, is a health of the planet, is a health of all the systems that are kind of entwined together, and different parts of this system have become taken over by this urge to make money our community our society doesn't work unless it's healthy physically healthy in this case but also mentally healthy we you know there's this is undercurrent of mental ill health that's you know an epidemic people might argue and that's because of the things that the way that things are set up is a really unhealthy way but also it's responsibility of the the providers to change as well very often it's ideological Or it's kind of practical, they're like, well, we've got all this organised and we don't want to change it. And we may as well continue scraping, you know, it's like emptying the till out, you know, as quickly as possible before the till snaps shut and it bites your fingers off. Those companies have got a responsibility. They can drive and they can shape demand through their supply. And if they don't, you know, supply is going to dry up because that's one of the key ways that I think we're going to feel the environmental crisis bite is that our food is going to become much more scarce, much more expensive. Ordinary people will suffer. The poorest will suffer first. Um, and that's an example. If these, you know, it's about responsibility. It's about fairness. It's about thinking of other, thinking longer term. Yeah, and that segues very neatly into my next question, which is about COP. So the the phrase that COP has failed is, is being bandied around a lot by XR. So I wonder how you subscribe to that. Uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Very strongly, there's very little good news to come out of it. By far the best news is that 
people are understanding that it, it hasn't done a sufficient job. Say one of the best things they said, oh, you know, we're going to stop chopping trees down in 20, by 2030 in some, and I'm like, really? You know, we're celebrating that. And I think it's the vested interest. It's those 500 fossil fuel delegates that, you know, squirrel their way into the COP26 that, that corrupted it. And so to me, this idea that COP has failed, yes, it did. You know, we're on a course now for 2.4 degrees with what they've said, which is basically the death of millions of people. You know, once once we get you know, the 1.5 degrees thing, that's I'm still not entirely convinced everyone understands 1.5 degrees. It just gets crazy. You know, it could get really crazy and it just gets out of control. So 2.4 degrees is like, you know, 0.9 degrees into the crazy zone, you know, and that's really bad. So you can't call that as a triumph. But I do think, you know, COP, COP has failed, but we can sort of say, actually, look, we need to step up now, you know. Things are going to change. They are, you know, everybody's talking about it. And that's one of the benefits, I think, of, the, you know, one of the successes coming out of COP is that the education part has got through. So in at COP25, which was now two years ago, Extinction Rebellion got voted as the number one influencer of the climate crisis by Onalytica. You know, XR has been incredibly successful at raising the awareness of the problem. And first, in order to address it, you have to be aware of it. So as we head to the end of the year and the end of this interview, towards the festival of overconsumption, I wonder how your Christmases might have changed with your growing awareness of the issues around uh, supply chains and overconsumption. How will your Christmases be different this time? So I already made all these changes back in 2019, and I would um, really ask, urge people to do the same and to feel good about it too. But that's the main thing is that you've got to feel good because it motivates you to make the next change. So, you know, my New Year's resolution was to buy pre-loved, to, you know, get everything from the charity shops and have the charity shop challenge. Um, that COVID has taught us what's really important to us is the coming together and being close with family and friends. And so it's more about, you know, quality time together, sharing delicious, nutritious vegan food together um, and, you know, switching from consumerism, realising, you know, especially when you have kids that, you know, these plastic bits of tat don't really keep them entertained for more than five minutes anyway. So um, engaging children in the fact that, you know, Christmas is going to be different on the gift front um, and getting them to want that, you know, discuss it with them and going, you know, how should we, how should we tackle this? And what can we do instead? So gifting experiences, gifting time together, um, you know, memories last much longer than, than, than items, you know, possessions and things. So um, yeah making all those eco swaps especially around christmas there's lots that can be done have a family discussion about it you know okay what what is it about christmas that's that's damaging to the planet and how could we do things differently and so it's actually a family um, agreement that this is how we're going to do it this year and i think most people would probably be quite happy of not having to spend so much money and having that stress of having to buy everybody a present and it's like no let's just bring some delicious food to the to the table and and just something for the kids that's from the charity shop or or something of your kids you know perhaps doing a swap from from households of you know a possession that you you have enjoyed um, and pass it on to the next family one of the things that I quite like doing when I have the time is making things for people, you know, like making them a Christmas card, you know, with like glitter and, you not know. glitter. No, <laughs> not, 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 not. Um, but, you know, just making things nice for people. I've told my family, you know, my mum, bless her, you know, she really wants to get me some presents because it's just not the same. And it's like, I understand that's so kind. It's so lovely. Um, but just don't. Um, just you know, get me some tasty thing or something that I'll enjoy and let's try and be happy together. Let's find some, you know, that warmth. You know, now we could actually have those things, you know, contentment, sufficiency, and actually just enjoy being together, especially after, you know, two years of messed up times. And last year we were locked down. To me, it's kind of focusing on what, what actually we think we really need and the only things that we need, you know, the things that we need to make that happen are probably less than we imagine, you know. Right. So let's uh, let's wrap this up like a like a charity bought jumper. And uh, uh, thank you very much, both uh, both of you for your time. It was absolutely fascinating. You're welcome, Pete.
Thank you for nice inviting one. us. Thank you, Pete. Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. Commissioned by the Climate Music Project. We communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericinwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.